Hey, I'm Ben from Modern Graham, and today we are going to talk about J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, a bank, a big bank that I use for my own business, for my own banking. But anyway, it, it's a big bank, and that's what we're going to talk about. Be sure to stick around to hear my valuation. So today, yeah, JPM, Financial Services, it's a bank. As of recording, it's trading at about 131.58. These figures are the most important that I view from the balance sheet. We have total current assets, total current liabilities, total long-term debt, total assets, intangible assets, total liabilities, and shares outstanding. These all will play into the valuation, so they are important to pay attention to. The graph here shows earnings per share over time, and we have 30 years of earnings data to look at here. We have raised up, then we hit a recession, came back down. Then we, uh, actually, that's like the tech crash there. Then we had a little bit of recession in here, I believe, and then we had the great recession that it still had positive earnings. That's really great to see. And since then, JP Morgan has been on a great rise. Dividends per share have been fairly steady. The great recession, they did drop some there but they were still positive. Let's look at the details. Earnings, like I said, they've been positive for th over 30 years, and that is great to see. EPSMG is a weighted average of the last five years, and that smooths out that business cycle so that you can have a little bit of a better idea of where the company is actually trending towards in the earnings uh, without considering the ups and downs of every little um, bounce in the business cycle. But anyway, you can see that those have been pretty much on the rise as well. Dividends over here, we have seen a lot of rise. Again, they halted the dividend growth during the early 2000s. Then they resumed them, and then the financial crisis hit, and they had to drop them considerably but they kept paying them. They didn't stop the dividend, which is key. You want to keep receiving that dividend. You really want to see it grow or at least not shrink, but you do really want to see a dividend. That is key to investing. Investing is when you give money to something and you get money back. So that is my little spiel about dividends. But pretty soon they are like shortly after that, they did recover and get the dividend back above where it had been, and that is good to see. It was a temporary drop. The dividend yield has been about 2 or 3%. They kind of keep that, and the dividend payout rate has been between 20 and 40%. It looks like they try to keep it at about 30%. So that would be one thing to keep in mind, that as that earnings is going up, your dividend is also growing. Look at all those growth rates in the last, what is that, uh, here, 11 years. No growth rate under 5%. So that is good to see in the dividend uh, growth. So stage one of the analysis, we want to see, is this company suitable for the defensive investor or the enterprising investor? And remember, the defensive investor is somebody who's not willing to do a lot of research into individual companies. So they have really stringent tests to figure out if they are going to be suitable for that. So first, market cap has to be over $2 billion. It passes that for sure. J.P. Morgan Chase is a big big bank and it passes the current uh, market cap requirement there. Current ratio has to be over two. Here it is 2.39. So that is a pass as well. That's good to see. Positive earnings per share for over 10 years. We passed that. Dividend for over 10 years. We passed that. And earnings growth over one third in the past 10 years from the beginning to the end. We have 135% growth in the past 10 years. So that is a pass. And PEMG, that is the price divided by that weighted average earnings per share. That comes to 11.19. It has to be below 20 for the defensive investor. It is, so we pass there. And the price to book ratio has to be below 2.5. Here it is, 1.5. So we pass that one. This one passes all seven requirements for the defensive investor. So it is a pass. It is suitable for defensive investors. 
enterprising investors. We'll take a look here real quick too. Current ratio, it has to be over 1.5. Pass. Debt to net current assets has to be under 1.1. It is here. It's 0.5. Positive earnings per share, dividend, and earnings growth. So it gets 5 out of 5 here too. Now, it would be suitable on its own right for the enterprise investor. But again, it's also suitable because it passed the more stringent defensive investor requirements. So that's a like key. It has passed every single requirement for either investor type. That is really good to see. Stage two, determination of the intrinsic value. We need to look to see how much is this company worth? Not how much is it trading, but how much is the company worth? Is the market right or is the market wrong? Usually the market isn't right. It's wrong in either direction. But what what's the case here? So the modern Graham value formula we take from Benjamin Graham's great investing tips the intelligent investor. And that formula is value equals earnings per share times eight and a half plus two times the growth rate. I use my weighted average earnings per share modern gram, as I call it. And so that's why I call it the modern gram value formula. So we have two variables to consider here. We have the earnings per share modern gram and the growth. Let's calculate both of them. Earnings per share modern gram, we look at the last five years, put the most weight on the current year and the lease weight on five years ago, and we get an earnings per share of 11.76. Plug that into our formula. Growth, we look at the earnings per share from currently and that from five years ago. So we have a total growth of 66%, divide that by five and we get to 13.26. Then we put a safety margin in because growth is a key variable in this formula. If you overestimate your growth, then you will have a huge impact on that intrinsic value estimate. You don't want to be over aggressive with growth. So we have the safety margin put in here to reduce that growth rate just to be careful. And here we find 9.94% as a long-term estimate of growth. And plugging that into the formula, we get a value of $333.82. So if you look at the chart here, that is way over the current price. The current price is $131, and the, that puts the price at 39% of the intrinsic value, which gives it an undervalued rating in my system. Now, another way of looking at this would be if you put in 3% growth, just 3%, then the value in the formula comes to $170. That's still more than the current price. If you put in 0% growth, you get a uh, pay or a value of $99.97, which is less than the current price. But then you know that the market is saying that it's somewhere between zero and three. Well, the market, if you put price in for value in the formula and then solve for growth, you end up with an implied growth rate of 1.34%. So the market believes that Chase will only grow at 1.34% in perpetuity. And if you think that it will grow more than that, then it might be undervalued. That's another way of looking at your market implied growth rate. Now, coming down here, the modern gram grade that looks at more factors and tries to assign a grade to the company based on all of the factors that play into the valuation. So we have investor suitability. It gets two points because it is suitable for the defensive investor. It gets one point because it is suitable or it is a good price to value. It is one point because it get it is trading below the gram number. Zero points for long-term dividend growth. Now, keep in mind, it has paid the dividend for over 30 years. That's great. But it has not grown the dividend for that whole time. So it does not get the the point there. It has a dividend yield above 2%. So it gets half a point there. And the PEMG is trading below the industry average. So it gets half a point there for a total score of five points, which comes to an A grade. This one has a very good grade. Stage three, further research into the company. If you are at the point where you've determined that it fits your investor type and it is undervalued, which is what we just did on stage two, then the next thing is for you to determine if it would be a good fit for your individual portfolio, taking into account 
your own diversification, your own goals and stuff like that. So to do that, you need to do further research. The net current asset value formula might be useful in that, but not for this company. It's negative, so it doesn't really give you much information to use here. The Graham number formula. This is another figure that a lot of people use when they are considering uh, Benjamin Graham's teachings. And it's a, a formula that is derived from a lot of the requirements for the defensive investor. And that comes to 150 50 SIPs, which is above the price of 131. So that is another thing to keep in mind. And again, the PEMG for this one is 11.19. The current ratio is 2.39. The PP ratio is 1.5. The dividend yield is 3%. And there are 12 years of consecutive dividend growth. Moving on to stage four in the analysis. If you've gotten this far and you've determined that it's a good fit for your portfolio, the next step would be to look at the market and try to time your entry point because you want to maximize your profit. It's not enough to just buy a company because it is undervalued. The market is moving up and down constantly. And it may be moving up while the company is undervalued, and then it may come back down and be an even better uh, time to buy. So you want to try to get that right. And one way to do that is to look at what the market has been doing through technical analysis. And you can see that back in October of 21, it started a downward trend. And it has kind of continued on that and tried to break through a little bit, but it came back up to about where it was a high point here and it came back down and then it came back up and it tried to break above that trend and it couldn't do it and it couldn't do it, couldn't do it all the way down here. And then it started to get pressure from this support level, which goes way back to about here. So you can see that it bounced up here and this is about where it jumped up in a, a jump back in November of 20. And this figure even goes back farther or this uh, support and resistance level goes even farther back. So that is a key point. And again, it couldn't fall back under and then it came back up. And then you can see that the pressure started to build with that trend line. Then it came back down and it, it looked like it was going to fall through, but then it hit this other point which is the bottom or like around here. And you notice this gap here. Well, one thing that the market tends to do is it tends to like to go back and fill the gap from time to time. And when it fell before over here, it didn't quite fill that gap. And so it came back up and then it came back down and it filled the gap. It hit that uh, support level and then it bounced back up to the trend line and then it broke through and tested this as support as it came back down and then it stayed up. And so now it is coming back up. Now looking at the momentum down here, the RSI, the relative uh, strength index, you can see that typically what we want to see is we want to watch. And when it is breaking above the 70 point and not falling below 30, then that indicates that the company is in a bullish trend or a bullish market sort of thing. Then over here, you can see it started to have trouble breaking above 70. And then it started to, it fell below 30. So now we're into a bearish trend. And of course, I need to upgrade that. But uh, we're in a bearish trend here. And you can see it kept failing to break above 70. And then it was still showing a bearish trend. But now it has broken above 70, which may indicate, and this is supported by this here, that it did fall below 30 briefly here, but it kind of bounced. And then it has not broken under there. And again, here it tested that uh, oversold region of 30 and it bounced back up. Now it's broken above here. It would seem to indicate that JP Morgan is now in a bullish pattern. So that would be one good thing to look, but it does indicate that it's a little bit overbought. We're, um, yeah, overbought. So I would anticipate that it's going to hit this and have a lot of trouble breaking through this. And it might come back down and we might see it either test about here at 123 
which would be a support level from here, or it might come all the way back down to here to 110 before going back up. But if it does come back down here and then start to bounce back up, that would be a great buying opportunity. If it breaks above 130 and it stays above there, then that would be a good buying opportunity. But I'd really be watching for it to come back down before heading back up. And that would be what I'm watching at this point with JP Morgan. So that is it for me today. Be sure to check out my other videos and hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. Take care.